speaking to us, Lord. Uh, Lord, those who, uh, Lord, were led by your Holy Spirit to come today, Lord. Father, we just make a declaration, Lord, that this would be a virus-free zone, Father, in the yes. name yes. of Jesus. Break illness, Lord. Do not allow illness to enter into our place of worship. Break it at the door, Father, in the name of Jesus. Anyone who has any kind of illness, they may be asymptomatic or have illness, we break the power of that illness in the name of Jesus, Father. We say release healing, Father, in people's lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, for those, Lord God, who are staying home, Lord, Father, pour out your spirit, Lord. Yes, We're asking God, Lord. for a corporate outpouring, yes, Lord. For us who are here, Lord, and for your people who are home, Father. Lord, pour out your spirit in a mighty and a powerful way, Lord. Uh, for the people, Lord, particularly in this tri-county area, Lord, where we've seen the most occurrences at this point uh, of coronavirus, Lord. We pray that you would release your healing power, Lord. Lord, there are churches that are, are streaming today, not, not meeting together. There are churches that are meeting together, but all your people are gathering together today to pray, Father. And we ask in the name of Jesus that, that you hear those prayers, or that our prayers would tip the bowl of incense, Lord, and that what would be poured out, Lord God, is healing, Father. Yeah. That what would be poured out is life, Father. That what would be poured out is, is uh, repentance, Father. That yes, what would Lord. be poured out is healing, Father. That what would be poured out is faith, hope, and love. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. And we yes. pray, Lord, for our brothers and sisters. Lord, I spoke uh, with a sister in Italy yesterday, Lord God. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, the, the, it's that, that country has just been, just been smashed, Lord. More deaths from the coronavirus in a country that has 60 million people than in China, which is a country that has over a billion people. We ask to pour out your spirit of yes, healing Lord. in Italy, Father. We ask that you would pour out your spirit of healing in Italy. Lord, I, I, I received uh, messages from brethren in Vietnam, Lord God, who are moving powerfully in the midst of this situation. We know your church in China, your church in Iran, Lord, two places where there are extensive, extensive, extensive uh, coronavirus outbreak, Lord. Protect your people, Lord, Do it, and Lord. strengthen your people and empower your people throughout this nation and in the nations of the earth. Yes, in Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we look to you for sovereign healing, but Lord, we also, um, Lord, we are grateful for wisdom to men, Lord. You have assembled great minds, Lord God. You've given them wisdom and intelligence, Lord, to deal with this coronavirus. Empower them today, we ask, Lord God, as they come together, Lord God, to seek, Lord, help and cure for this virus, Lord, that you ultimately would get the glory. Father. Yes. Lord, I want to lift up Ruth Ann this morning, who has currently been admitted to Royal Beaumont, suffering with terminal cancer. Lord, I ask that you touch her, Lord God, and you release your healing, Father, in Jesus' name. Release sovereign healing to Ruth Ann. Give peace to her. Give peace to her three children, Lord God, and comfort her, I ask in this hour, Lord. I also pray, Lord God, and protect your grandson, Jackie, yes. during this yes. time, Lord, that you have placed a We've asked you to place a bubble around that home, Lord God. Father, even if, if Jay is committed to have to go to work next week, Lord, we ask for a strategy, Lord God, in confining him from Jackie, Lord. Give us strategy. Help us in this hour, Lord. We look to you. And we trust you, Lord. We don't move in unhealthy fear, Lord. We move in the fear of the Lord, which is brings understanding, Lord God. So help us this hour, we ask, yes, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord God, we just thank you that our faith, Father God, is strong. We believe, we trust in you and in your name. We know that you died on the cross for us, Jesus. We know that he 
healing is ours, Father. Continue, Lord God, to cover us individually, Lord God, as families. Cover them, Lord, and keep us as we move in and about and around and work or, or, or wherever we may go, Father, we need to go to the store or whatever it may be. Continue to be with us, Lord Jesus. Yeah. And continue, continue to cover us in the name of Jesus, yeah. Lord God. Cover us oh, in the name of Jesus. Keep us safe. Father God, keep Thanks. us strong. Lord God, and quick healing, Father God. Let them come up with a quick antidote, a quick solution yes. to yes, this. Lord. So that we can get back to normal, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you because we know you are bigger than the coronavirus. Yes. You are bigger than anything that exists, God. And we say it now, Lord God. You are bigger. You are powerful. Father God, you reign in Jesus' name. Yeah, Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you,
to gain focus, Lord, on what you are doing and about to do in the earth, Lord. In Jesus' name. Yes. service. We're going to, uh, we'll do the Lord's Supper and Louise is going to give us a protocol uh, on how to do that. And we're going to also take our collection at the same time. So Louise, go ahead and share with us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our new normal. <laughs> um, we just want to remind you of the new protocols that we're putting in place to keep everybody safe. Number one, the back door is going to remain locked. We're having everybody come in the front door. We'll use the hand sanitizer, and um, we can constantly wipe the handles down and stuff. And that's just for your protection and our protection. Right now at communion, we're asking that um, those with little children, please come and get the cups for your children. Keep your children in their seats. And then afterwards, we will... Um, have the ushers collect the cups. We don't want the children running around and um, just for their safety and ours as well. Um, at the same time, we're asking that you bring your tithe up. And there's baskets up here. You can put your tithes in the baskets. That way, then we're not passing a basket and passing who knows what around at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so that's really the, the protocol for the communion and how the service is going to go after the communion then there's going to be a word and um, then we're going to go from there so everyone we just welcome you thank you for coming out try to keep a distance between people if you
you're sitting in a row with someone that you don't normally live with, you know, husbands and wives and children, they often sit together, they've been together, but, um, you know, just try and, and put a couple seats between you, just keep that distance. And um, I think that's about it. We, um, we're ready for communion. Pastor Jan is going to come up and give a short word for us. And Okay. Is this odd, Rob? It can be whenever you're ready. Yes, we're ready. Just don't tap on it. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, last night, really, I felt like the Lord spoke out of John 15, starting with verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. And I just kept thinking of all the lines in the grocery store, all the places we go, we can be a witness, Amen. we can bear much fruit, yeah. we, can, we can just do things for people. As my Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. And I just want to conclude by saying, Jesus left glory to come to earth. We don't even know what he left. We will know one day. But he left all that is perfect and all that is wonderful to come to earth to save us. And he was in tune, in constant communication with the Father until that last few minutes of his life or hours on the cross when the Father turned his back to him. And that is the first and only time Jesus was separated from his Father. And I always wonder, like, where did he go for those three days? What did he do? And I'm, I'm going to guess he did what he always did. He went to set the captives free. Yeah. So today, he's really asking the church to show fruit, to really reach out to those people that need, need help, to really remain in love with everybody, but especially to dim mm -hmm. and touching. So as we conclude um, communion and we take the bread and wine, let us remember how awesome our God truly is. How truly awesome our God is. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good word. Okay, let's uh, begin partaking. As we said, parents, get uh, the cups for your children.
off it. I talk a little bit about the announcements and then we're going to go into the message. And then we're going to close with worship, which will be a little different from how we normally do things. We have had uh, in this uh, week a lot of cancellations. Uh, one of the things is the Master Builders National Conference has been canceled. Uh, we'll, I'll send emails out. I, I, I know we, uh, we're passing out invitations for that, but I'll send that email out just to let everybody know. Uh, the CDC has recommended uh, you know, this kind of eight-week window before uh, major events uh, could potentially begin again. That's a recommendation. That's on a national level, and we knew that the Master Builders Conference was within that eight-week schedule. And we actually called the, uh, the retreat center, and, and they, they've had to shut that down for the very reason that you, know, you, you have great numbers of people coming uh, to a, 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 a retreat center to have uh, meetings, and they're not allowed to do that right now. So the Master Builders National Conference has been canceled. We will. Um, we will see what we do with that in the future. There was a Convoy of Hope meeting uh, last week that was um, canceled. We had a Greater Detroit Partnership Pastors meeting that was canceled on Saturday. The Roar Prayer Gathering was canceled. Um, Jonathan and Charlotte Neme were supposed to be guest speakers here at Lord of the Harvest, but we released them today. Uh, most churches are going to be streaming right now. And uh, we will be streaming, uh, and it may come to the point where we just stream a service and we don't have, have anybody here. That's what a lot of churches are doing. They're streaming a service without really anybody there for their entire church. So one of the things is the church is going to need to get more savvy in using our technology. But Andrea Elliott is going to be sending out instructions on live streaming because we'll do more things. We're going to be live streaming. Uh, Bible studies. We're going to be doing a lot of different things. We're just going to have to use some technology. One of the things that we're starting with tonight, our AWE prayer gathering, which normally meets the fourth Sunday of the month at different churches, was scheduled tonight at Life Application Ministries. We decided to try a Zoom meeting uh, for that. So what we're going to do tonight is we're, we're going to actually pray together uh, in, a, in a Zoom meeting conference call. We're going to have our AWE meeting. So this is going to be the first time we're going to try that. Um, if somebody is interested, now we did send out invitations, and we sent out invitations. You have to go through online to get the invitation. Uh, we sent those invitations out to people who normally have been showing up. If you didn't get an invitation or you're interested in being in the online one tonight, see either Louise or me before you go and, and we'll, we'll send that email out to you uh, after church service. The actual invite's gonna come, what, about 5.45 tonight, Louise? About 5.45, uh, you'll, you'll get an email and it'll show you how to link in with us. The one thing we ask everybody is when you link in, mute you your phone. See, that's the one thing we, 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 we did a leadership team meeting uh, 13 of us on Wednesday. There was a lot of a lot of uh, background noise, and what we have to learn is when we're not speaking, we have to mute our phone or mute our our, our iPad. So we'll we'll do that. But if, if you want to get into the meeting, you'll get an email before 5:45. So if you didn't get an email and you want to be part of that, let Louise know or let me know. I mean, right now we're still scheduled to, uh, there are some things that are going to continue uh, at uh, the Lord of the Harvest. I mean, we're canceling our Easter egg hunt right now, but Pastor Andrea and the Family Connections team are going to work out what they're going to do with that, but we're canceling that. Our food pantry is going to continue to serve the community during its regular hours. Our food pantry is just like a grocery store situation. It's considered an essential need, and it's definitely an essential need uh, for, for uh, people that we service. What we've been doing is we're not bringing all the people in here. The people are lining up in cars, and we're taking bags out to them. Here's where I have a request. Young people, yeah. you know the majority of the workers 
for our food pantry, our senior citizens, the people who are high up. Take Tuesdays and Wednesdays. The actual food pantry is open from 9.30 until noon, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But if you could get here, uh, what would be the, what would be, I, I don't see Mary or Janine here. What, what time do we really get going in the morning? Probably about 8.30. 8, 8.30. If we could, if we could get volunteers here, eight thirty or nine on Mondays, Tuesdays, and one thirty or two. Tuesday is eight thirty till noon. Wednesday would be eight thirty till noon. Once again, so we can start getting young people to come and help us with that. What we're going to be doing is opening up our our campus here for prayer. We're going to see if people who are driving by want to be prayed for. And so we're gonna we're gonna be dispatching people to pray for people all outdoors. The cars will just pull up. We'll give them their their groceries. We'll ask them if they want prayer, and we're gonna be bringing in more people for prayer. Whoever wills. So it's gonna be a real time, an opportunity for ministry. We are our Wednesday afternoon Why Jesus meetings are going to be. Uh, we're going to uh, be praying. It's a small group. We're still going to be praying on, on Wednesdays at noon. Now, are we meeting this week or are we meeting next week? When does it start? Next week. All right, this Wednesday, yeah, we're going to still continue the Why Jesus meeting at noon. It's the, the women's prayer meeting. We're, going to, we're just going to come and pray. And the truth is, if men want to come and pray, you know, if you want to come up here and pray, we'll put you in the sanctuary here. You can pray anytime. The, the office hours are still open, which will be those Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. Uh, Pastor Bird is going to start a Wednesday evening Bible study on April the 1st. It's going to be held every other week. You're free to come here. What what time is that going to start? 6.30 to 7.30. 6.30 to 7.30 will be the study. Starting Wednesday, April 1st. And again, we may, if, if things change, we may end up streaming that. We may end up uh, uh, doing that through Zoom or doing that through live stream. But right now it's scheduled to start on April the 1st, 6.30 to 7.30. Thursday corporate prayer meeting is canceled this week, but starting next Thursday, March 26th, uh, we will have a meeting. What time is the meeting, the prayer meeting on Thursday nights? We can see everybody who comes. All right, it's 7 p.m. On Thursdays, not this Thursday, but starting next Thursday. And the Saturday night, most excellent white meetings are going to continue. Those are at 5 p.m. We met this Saturday, and we're going to continue to do that. Right now, the AWE Good Friday service is still on for April the 10th until we hear differently. The National Day of Prayer for May 7th until we hear differently. And May 8th, the Greater Detroit Partnership Joint Worship Service until we hear differently. Is there Scott, anything? Scott, just uh, on the live stream, he just said that the Thursday night prayer meeting starts at 7. Thursday night prayer meeting starts at 7 p.m. And it won't be this week, but, but it will be the following week. All right. Any, any other? Yeah, the Sunday school classes are going to be canceled. We're going to keep the keep our children with us as as we have the the the, the word. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start now. I'm gonna go right into the word. And honestly, it killed me not to be here uh, last week, uh, but uh, I wasn't here. Uh, I quarantined myself, and I'll give you. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about quarantining. Uh, in a moment, but let's open in prayer as we go to the word. Father, we come before your throne in Jesus' name. Thank you for your people who are gathered here together, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would move powerfully and mightily in our midst. May your word bring clarity, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 What I really want to start out with is, I want to start out with a uh, couple passages. I'm just, I'm going to string together some passages. They may seem loosely related, but they, they're, they're there to exhort us and encourage us to press into Jesus. One of the things that we need to recognize is 
we don't really know what's going on here. This is, this is new ground for us. This is historical for me. The, the closest thing I can liken this to, and I was, wasn't born until it was over, is World War II. We have not had a situation like this in our lifetime. And that's, for me, being closer to 70 than to 60. We have not had a situation like this. So there's clearly uncertainty. Uh, a lot of people are saying a lot of things. Um, let, me, let me say this. There are some course corrections that are going to be taking place in the world in this hour. There are going to be some things that God is going to be dealing with the world and the church. The Lord has our attention right now. But one of the things that Pastor Jan, and this was one, one of the verses I was going to start with, she quoted it in John 15. So we're going to, we're going to look at some passages in Scripture and we'll make some comments and try to tie this all together. But what the overriding message for me is, is we don't know the Master's will. That's the problem in the church. That's the problem in the earth. We don't really know the Master's will. But the Master is going to show us his will. It is really the safest place to be in God is in the center of his will. Whatever that may be. Wherever that may be. Whatever that may mean. The safety is in obedience. And so what we need to really do in this hour is to discern the master's will. And Jesus said this in John 15, 13. Pastor Jan made reference to it in the communion. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. All right. Jesus is going to call us his friends, which means he's the one who has laid his life down for us. And because of that, we know that everything Jesus requires of us in situations like we I find ourselves in now, it's all going to be surrounded by his love, contextualized by his love. He says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So we start with his love. His love leads us to obedience. His love causes us to understand that we are his friends and being his friends, walking in his love, leads to obedience. The way to discern the Lord's will is to walk in his love and allow it to shape us to walk in obedience. He says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. Yes, we are the servants of the Lord. That's where we begin. But the Lord is calling us in this hour to be more than servants. Yeah. He's calling us to be friends. A servant doesn't understand what God is doing. We need in this hour to understand what God is doing, why he's doing it, how he's doing it, and what goal and objective it's going to lead us to. We will do that. He is going to disclose his will to us. When I have struggled, whether it's with uncertainty, fear, concern, confusion, and I get back to the Lord in prayer, I have been starting my prayers like this, Lord, I don't understand your will. I don't understand what you're doing. And because I don't understand what you're doing, my whole life is, is discombobulated. Mm -hmm. I need to know your will. And then the Lord will speak to me and say, Yes, this is exactly what's going on right now. Do I have your attention, son? Do I have the attention of the world? You don't understand what I'm doing. The kind of Christianity that most of us live in, it's a Christianity that kind of just, just conforms Christianity to my lifestyle, my American lifestyle, my worldly lifestyle, instead of having my life conform to his life kingdom. So one of the things that we need to pray for very significantly is we need to pray for the will of the Father to be made clear. We need to understand what his will is. So he says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus wants to reveal his will to us. It's going to be disconcerting. 
it's going to be upsetting. Hey, has your life been upset? Has your life been turned upside down? The new normal. The new normal is a quarantine, and we, we just got, we've got to just figure out how to battle this disease. The new normal is, Lord, show your friend, me, what you're doing so that I can do it. The next verse I want to read, I want you to go to the book of Revelation. In Revelation, the first six seals are being opened in Revelation chapter 6. And we get to the sixth seal, and actually the whole chapter of Revelation 7 is part of the sixth seal. And I want you to look at what the sixth seal is by going back to Revelation 6.12. I looked when he, that's the, the lamb, when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So the sixth seal, and again, brethren, do not look for everything in the book of Revelation to be fulfilled literally. It is a symbolic book. This is a picture that says, when God shakes the earth in his judgment, in his wrath, and in his anger, he shakes it, and everything gets shaken. And even those in power, even those safe, even those secure, are shaken. And we may liken what's happening in our world to this. Maybe it's, it's, it's not quite as bad as this yet, but we're saying things are being shaken up. But I want you to see that when God shakes things up, whether we call it his judgment or not, when God shakes things up, he pauses. And after this seal is broken to release pandemonium or pandemics in the earth, I want you to see what God does. He's shaking everything up. His judgment, his anger, his wrath has come. But then there's a pause. And God deals with his people. And I want us to see this and understand this. For after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. God's seal. You know, when you seal a legal document, that seal signifies that this is it has legal binding. So an angel comes. The winds are stopped in the midst of all this shaking that's going on in the earth. And the angel of the Lord has the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And whenever God's judgment comes in the earth, the Lord seals his people. He protects his people. He puts the stamp of his authority saying, these are my people. And whatever's going on in the earth, I am watching over my people. I am protecting my people. I am leading my people. I am authorizing my people to preach the gospel. I am strengthening my people to follow after me. So we need to keep that in the back of our minds. And no matter what is going on in this hour, the Lord is going to seal us and the Lord is going to protect us. Okay, a few observations here. You may remember at the start of the year, Steve Fado had a dream. And I shared that dream with you. Let's go back to January of this year. Steve Fado spoke this at a master builders meeting. And what he said to us was, 
in his dream, he saw people. He saw people scattering and people fleeing and people running and people afraid. There was this great, great disaster coming to the earth. And he said what he saw in the sky was like a meteor, a large meteor that was headed toward the earth to crash. And the people were running and the people were fleeing. And he said, the spirit of the Lord said to say, America, it's coming sooner than you think. That was the word of the Lord. And we shared it here in January. We're here. But now here's a little, little, little side note. And Steve didn't see this, but I did a little research on it. And I looked up, I, I, I did some research on a meteorite. And when a meteorite comes out of the sky, it's there's a blue and a red light that, that it, it has to do with, with the, the, the gases in the air meeting the meteor. And there's, there's light that refracts off that meteor. And you know what that light is called? It's called its corona. Steve saw that vision from the Lord, that, that message from the Lord, even clearer, even clearer than he was even aware of. So, 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 so we're going to say that we, we, we have a little bit of confidence in Steve Fado and his prophetic word. He also asked the Lord, now this he just shared with us this past Wednesday on our national conference call. He also, he hadn't shared this with us when he shared the dream about the, the, the coronavirus coming in essence. He asked the Lord, he said, Lord, give, give, me, give me some understanding. Give me a, a word. Give me a, 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 a vision, a, 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 something that I can share with the church. What are you going to do in 2020? This was at the end of 2019, around the same time. And he said, when, when he asked the Lord that the Lord showed him the number nine, that was it. And Steve said, guys, I thought that was, I thought that was pretty wimpy. He goes, gee, he goes, I asked you, Lord, to show me what's going to happen in, in, in 2020, and you show me the number nine. Boy, I, I'm pretty pathetic if that's all I got. Well, what Steve began to do is he began to research the significance of the number nine. And he just came up with two things for the number nine and then made them in a prophecy. And I'm going to add a few more things about the number nine. But turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew records Jesus' death on the cross. Matthew 27. And in Matthew 27, Jesus is dying on the cross. Verse 38 talks about the two robbers being crucified with him. Verse 39 talks about those passing by blaspheming him and, and, and quoting things that he said and, and using them to mock him. Chief priests and, and the scribes and the elders are mocking him in 41 and 42. Oh yeah, he said he's the Messiah. Look at him on the cross. Uh, and, and they, they're, they're just reviling him. The robbers who are crucified with him revile him. And that brings us to the 45th verse. And this was the first thing that Steve noted. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. There's the number nine. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness over the whole land. And he believes now that the Lord was showing him nine for 2020. There was going to be darkness over the whole land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, he quotes the 22nd Psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Steve said he felt the Lord was saying great darkness would come over, people would even feel forsaken by the Lord. But then he says, continue reading. Some of those who stood there when they heard that said this man is calling for Elijah, he wasn't. He was quoting the 22nd Psalm, the first verse in Aramaic, which is Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him for drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Great darkness comes over the land in number nine. 
There's this feeling, even by Jesus, God has forsaken him. Jesus cries out and dies. But immediately after this, the veil of the temple is torn in two. From top to bottom, the earthquakes and the rocks split. And what Steve said is what's going to emerge from this darkness, he believes the Lord was saying in front number nine, is the manifestation of God's glory is going to come out of the temple as the veil of the temple is rent. So there was darkness, death, but God moved power. That was his first image. His second image, and it's a passage we've quoted here at Lord of the Harvest in Luke 17. The second image is Jesus cleansing 10 lepers in Luke 17, 11. Now it happened as Jesus went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice and glorified God and fell down at, on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. He said, Jesus, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not found any who returned to give God glory except this foreigner? And Steve said the second thing the Lord showed him with number nine is people who've been touched by the Lord but have left the Lord. People who have touched by the Lord and have backslidden from the Lord. And he believes that the Lord is showing that there's going to be a great return by those who are backslidden from the Lord in the midst of this time and season. Let me give you two more references to the number nine. I want you to go with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus. Let's see. I've got this on my, my, my Bible app here. Go with me to Leviticus chapter 23. The high holy day of the Jewish nation is actually the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. And there are certain things that take place on Yom Kippur. And the first one I want to look at is in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 says this, and it sounds as if the day of atonement is on the 10th day of the seventh month. But it is actually, it begins on the evening of the ninth day of the seventh month and goes through the evening of the tenth day. The day of atonement is the ninth day of the month. And this was the highest holy date of the Jewish calendar. Leviticus 23, verse 26. The Lord said to Moses, the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. There's the tenth day. Hold a sacred assembly Deny yourselves and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. To deny themselves was to fast. The only feast of the Jews that required a fast was a single day fast on the Day of Atonement, which began on the ninth day of the seventh month. They were also to present an offering made to the Lord by fire. They were to fast they were to sacrifice, they were to do no work on that day, verse 28, because it's the day of atonement, when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God. Anyone who does not fast on that day must be cut off from his people. I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on that day. So there's a ceasing of activity. That's what Sabbath is. You think the Lord's put the world in a Sabbath at this moment, a ceasing of activity? Anyone who does not fast on that day must be cut off from his people. Verse 30, I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. It is a Sabbath of rest for you. You must fast. From the evening of the ninth day of the month 
until the following evening you are to observe your Sabbath. Now, just to understand what was taking place on the Sabbath uh, of, of the Day of Atonement, it was, a, it was a, a holy Sabbath unto the Lord. You have to go back to Leviticus 16. We're not going to read the whole chapter of Leviticus 16, but we're going to read some of the relevant portions for you to understand what was taking place on the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, atonement was made for the sanctuary. The sanctuary was the place that God established to dwell in the midst of his people. The Holy of Holies, the 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 uh, a mercy seat. This is where the Lord dwelt. He dwelt in the midst of Israel. Now, one of the things that we need to understand, and the Jews had a very clear concept of clean and unclean. You know, that, that's, that's what this situation is about. This passing on the virus. It's about remaining clean and to be infected by the virus is to be made unclean. We are dealing with a clean and unclean situation. Do we understand that Jews were very, very aware of clean and unclean? They constantly cleansed themselves. Some of the clean and unclean was spiritual cleanness and spiritual uncleanness. But the Jews had a very clear concept of clean and unclean for health's sake. Do you understand that? Quarantine is mandated in the Bible. We learn our quarantine laws from Scripture. Leprosy, the, the, a Jew with leprosy was, was quarantined from the rest of the Jews to keep them from communicating that illness. Quarantine is part of God's will. By the way, I sent out to my leaders yesterday, and Reggie Holiday had sent it to me. I sent out a video on from YouTube and you what I want you to do is if you're interested in in following this I mean I can text it to you or you can simply go to YouTube and it's you can look up under the ABC forum yeah, ABC forum the topic biblical quarantine and it's a 25 minute video on how quarantine is God's will we need to understand this. Quarantine was something that was enacted in the Old Testament to keep disease from spreading. And our, our, our modern quarantine perspectives are based on that. By the way, the, the brother who shares this, the, the, brother, the brother who shares this, uh, he is a doctor. He's a medical doctor from South Africa. He's also an apostle from South Africa. Very, very, very good. Very good. In fact, what we really need to understand is, is, is quarantine is probably the biblical perspective in this. You need to be told by the Lord if you want to, if he wants you to come out of quarantine, such as our ministering the food bank. We're coming out of quarantine to do a life-saving act for our brothers and sisters. But the reality is we, we shouldn't say, well, you need to come out and, and in faith. Well, actually, you need to stay home and only come out if God has spoken to you. We do not want to bend the need to fear in this hour, but what we want to do is use wisdom, and we want to use God with caution. It's very interesting because he talks about the different plagues that have taken place uh, in, in human history. He, talks, he, he lists some of the more notable ones. In the, the link is already shared on church Facebook page and we'll share it. Okay. We've got a, we've got a link for that for that video. We're talking about uh, historical quarantines. One of the worst quarantines that we're familiar with in, in our history is in the 14th century, the Black Plague, the bubonic plague. It wiped out about one third of the population of Europe. You know what group was spared from the Black Plague? The Jews. And you know why? Because they understood quarantine from the Old Testament. They immediately went into quarantine. Jews were spared. 
Now, we also understand that when Jesus moved miraculously, he went around touching people all the time he wasn't supposed to touch. That's Jesus. Jesus releases healing to people. And God can commission us in this hour to do his work and to release ourselves from quarantine. But we, we have to understand that, that God uses quarantine. Now, what does that have to do with, with the Day of Atonement? Well, first of all, it has to do with clean and unclean. And God's people were unclean. They were unclean because of their sin. And what they would do is their, they would transmit their uncleanness to the sanctuary, to the place where the Lord dwelt. So once a year, the Lord would make atonement for the sanctuary. Passover is the feast where we are made individually clean, where the blood over the door, where the blood over the door kept God's people safe from the death angel. Passover represents individual cleansing. The Day of Atonement is a corporate cleansing. The sanctuary was cleansed, the priests were cleansed, the people were cleansed as the people of God. Ninth day is when the Day of Atonement took place, the ninth day of the seventh month. Could we see or could we relate to what's going on right now following Steve's prophetic pattern here? Could we understand that what the Lord is going to do is a great act of cleansing on the church and a great act of cleansing upon the presence of God, a great act of cleansing upon the ministry, the priest, and a great act of cleansing upon the people of God. Let's pick up with the verse 15 in Leviticus 16. This is the high priest shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. This was on the, the seat where God's throne was, where the Lord sat in the Holy of Holies. Atonement was made for the place where God would dwell. It was to make it pure and clean for God to come in and dwell in his presence among the people. In this way, verse 16, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of the meeting, which is the, the, the remainder of the tabernacle, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of the meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward a live goat. He lays hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and puts it on the goat's head. The goat goes out into the wilderness. Verse 23. The Aaron is, uh, then Aaron is to go into the tent of the meeting and take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place. He is to leave them there. He shall bathe himself with water in a holy place, cleanness and uncleanness, and put on his regular garments. Then he shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself and the burnt <coughs> offering for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. He shall also burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who releases the goat as the scapegoat, again, notice washing, must wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. The bull and the goat for the sin offerings, whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement, must be taken outside the camp. Their hides and flesh and offal are to be burned up. 
the man who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. And here's the conclusion. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the 10th day of the seventh month, beginning on the course of the ninth, the evening of the ninth, you must fast, not do any work, because on this day of atonement, what will be made for you is atonement to cleanse you. Then before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of rest, and you must deny yourself. It's a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make the atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, and the priests and all the people of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be a once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, we understand Jesus is our Yom Kippur. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. But these are prophetic applications of the number nine. Could the Lord in this hour be causing the church to cease, to slow down, to rest, to be quarantined? Now, what I mean by quarantined is, remember, if you're quarantined and you're, you're home watching movies and playing video games and playing the games on your cell phone, that's not the quarantine we're talking about. The quarantine is a Martha and Mary situation. Martha works, 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 and works. Mary quarantines herself, stops working, and rests in the presence of the Lord. We just need to understand, take the time that God is giving us in this hour to gather as a family, to pray, to gather, gather as a family, to worship the Lord, to gather as a family, to press into Christ, to gather as an individual who's quarantined, to press into Jesus so we can get his will. The Lord is going to make the place clean. He's going to make the church clean. He's going to cause the body of Christ to rise up. One final illustration of the number nine. The number nine was the ninth of Av, and this is a, 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 a post-biblical application. When the Jews taught they, 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 they took the scripture when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. They took the scripture and they discerned that the day that he destroyed the temple was on the ninth of Ab. It was the ninth day of the month. It is also said that the second temple that was destroyed after Jesus in 70 AD was also on the ninth of Ab. So the ninth speaks of dis destruction and deconstruction. One of the things that's consistent, a consistent principle throughout all of Scripture, is the Lord tears things down in order to build things up. That's called death and resurrection. In our own lives, he tears things down that he might build something up. In the human history, he tears things down that he might build things up. He tears down the temple under Nebuchadnezzar that he might raise up a righteous community. He destroys the temple in 70 AD that he might build up a spiritual temple called the church. The Lord is always doing this. And we need to recognize the number nine speaks that God tears things down that he may start things up. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. And while you're on your way to Jeremiah 1, we are in, in, in discussions with pastors groups, and I've been in several, even just in the past week, the word that has been going forth is, the Lord may be changing the entire way we do church. He might, this, this might be one of, one of the, the, the things that the Lord wants to do, is he wants church to be done differently. He may not want churches to be gathering in a building anymore. He may want the, the whole way we view church how we do church, how we look at church, to be completely torn down that he can build something up. So we cannot just be in dismay or despair if we don't meet together like this. We may be meeting together different ways, different manners. We may be meeting in smaller groups. We may be meeting in people's homes. We're going to use technology to meet. 
We're going to be doing things, but we have to recognize what the Lord said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1. When the Lord called him, he said to Jeremiah in 1 verse 9, Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot, to tear down, to destroy, to overthrow, and then to rebuild and to replant. We have to be prepared in this hour to see whatever the Lord is doing in our midst. What he may be doing in our midst is changing the entire way we do church, the entire way we understand church. Now, I also, I've got just a couple more remarks and then we're going to worship. First of all, last year I said, this year is the 50th year. The Lord is going to release the year of Jubilee. People are looking and saying, boy, does it look like Jubilee out there? Well, remember the, the, the point of Jubilee. For a whole year, everything stopped. The economy stopped. Their way of life stopped. Everything stopped. And in that year, the Lord reset everything in the stoppage of the year of Jubilee. And what he did in the year of Jubilee, he canceled death. The people who, who had to stop their, their economic production for a year, just like in the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement says you, everything has to stop and seize on that day. This was not just a day of stopping. This was a year of stopping. And what did the Lord say to his people? I will provide for you supernaturally in that year. Yeah. When everything stops, I'm going to cancel death. See, everybody gets put on the same same yeah. ground in the year of Jubilee. They're no longer rich and poor. Right. They're no longer slave and free. Everybody is trusting in the Lord to provide. But everything stops. Debt is canceled. Slavery is canceled. And inheritance is returned to people. People who lost property and had sold themselves into indentured servitude, they were Restored Their property, their land, their, their, their family inheritance was restored to them. Here's an interesting point about the year of Jubilee. You know when the year of Jubilee started? It started on the ninth day of the seventh month. The, 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 the day of atonement in the 50th year. Wow. So what became a single day celebrated for 50 years, or 49 years, became an entire year of stock. If we are stopped, brethren, for a year, then let's trust the Lord, let's press into the Lord, let's get the will of the Lord clear, and let's do what the Lord has for us. Amen. Finally, finally, and this is just my own image, but I just see sick people coming to the body of Christ and hands being laid on people and people being healed. Yeah. I just see it. I just see that God wants to do that in this hour. Yeah. So for, for us, as we press into the Lord in our individual time, as we press in together, as we press in in worship, which we're about to do, let's press into God for to be activated, that healing anointing to be activated. Let us constantly pray for people to get healed. When we hear about people getting healed, let's pray for healing from a distance. Yeah. When we're with people together, let's pray for healing. Let's just continually pray for healing that the Lord might do signs and wonders among us. Steve Parker was here from Africa. He gave us a prophetic word that has not yet been fulfilled at Lord of the Harvest. We want to see it fulfilled. He said, Lord of the Harvest, you have fed people bread, but now you will feed them heavenly bread, and there will be signs and wonders. We are waiting for that word to be fulfilled. Teresa Vanderbess had the dream. Remember the church was packed with backsliders and prodigals and the Lord began throwing bread to people in the congregation. So Lord, I'm going to close with this word of prayer and this word of encouragement to our people. 
Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. We're going to worship you, Lord. We're going we're to close out the service in worship, and we are asking you, Father, in the name of Jesus, give us bread from heaven. Do it, Lord. Press us into you, yes. Lord God. Cause us to know your will if we do not understand your will. Reconform your church to your image. If you need to tear things down in order to build things up, we accept that. And show us, Lord, the new way of doing church in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Worship team, come and now lead us out. Everybody, you're, you're, you can stay for worship. You can, you can, you're free to leave. You're free to pray. Do whatever you want. But we're, we're going to officially close out the meeting with worship. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Go in peace. And just stay, stay, stay posted. We'll see what we're going to do uh, for services in the future. But we are going to start getting technology kinds of things out to you. We're going to start doing some things. Amen. For those of you watching on the live cast, we are going to be posting the links to the songs we're doing. Um, Andrea is creating a playlist. And we'll share that on our YouTube channel. Um, otherwise, thank you for watching and be blessed. We'll see you next Sunday and keep praying through this.